Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door, and it is an incredible pleasure for me to welcome again. Uh, I'm going to call him my friend because on Facebook it says we're friends. Absolutely. Uh, and Facebook is always right, right? Uh, Ramon Ray, uh, welcome. For anybody that possibly doesn't know you, I think there's still plenty of people we have to get you there. Uh, just give me your one-minute pitch. Who is Ramon Ray? Sure. And Zeb, by the way, just want to say thanks for having me. Thanks for all the work you've done for so many years in marketing and helping uh, businesses grow. So it is good to see you again. And I wish blessings to you, your family, and everybody who means something to you in your world. So thank you for having me. But yes, Ramon Ray, founder of smarthustle.com. We're a media company that uh, educates and inspires small business owners to start and grow successful businesses. And I uh, work with very, very large brands and help them reach small businesses kind of on the influencer marketing side of things. They don't need us to drive revenue they can do billions of dollars of facebook ads and get super bowl commercials so they're doing quite fine but they have a little budget set aside for what some people call influencer marketing to kind of enhance their credibility and things like that so that's the space we fill in and of course a, a keynote speaker and motivator entertainer on on some respects uh for for uh, large business organizations as well so that's a bit of who i am and uh glad to be here with you so I think we met eight years ago, eight plus years ago, and five years ago when I started the podcast, way before everybody and their fourth cousin three times removed jumped into this world during COVID, um, you were my first guest. Then I got too busy where I couldn't really devote myself to podcasting, so I kind of let it, let it drop. Uh, but back then, and I know you remember after I interview, you called me literally as soon as we hung up. And you said, holy crap, you got me to say things. And it, it was amazing. So I want to top that one today. Okay. Um, and so you are, you're an incredibly open, transparent guy. Um, you openly talk about, I think there's no subject that's, that I haven't seen you talk about or bring up in all the different platforms that, that we're connected and we follow. And I want to touch on a few of them today. But you are, sure. I think you are the only guy on LinkedIn that actually has a formula on it. It says 4X, 2X, 4X. So to, to tell people what that means, four times entrepreneur. Oh, two, yes, yes. 2X exits, four times author. Um, so let, let me just go back the way I'd like to start this with all my guests sure. to your early years when somebody ran into you when you were a teenager or whatever age it was and said, Ramon, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you remember what that was? Absolutely. I wanted to be in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Absolutely. Without a heartbeat. That's still on my mind. So yes, Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's it. Do you remember why? I mean, I think I think we all uh, want to wear we all want to wear not, sunglasses and that earpiece and be cool. Well, right? that's we yeah, have more secret service. But yes, um, I, I don't know. I just G-Men, uh, the the push-ups. Uh, that was when I wrote the uh, Federal Bureau Investigation Field Office, where I was living at the time. I, I tried to do push-ups, couldn't do them, and uh, I read a lot of books. There was a guy named Colby back in the day. He had some red, like you know, the cardboard type pr printed matter books in the in the early 80s whatever it would be at the local library and so don't know why Zeb just something about investigation and being James Bond wasn't on my mind then but now you know mashing all that together the, the next James Bondish uh rescuing people maybe an uh, investigation maybe they had a gun I don't, I don't know so not so much the earpiece and glasses at that go on the secret service men in black side of the world but yeah. it was just that g-man government I, they weren't, they're not spies at all. They're investigative, but that's kind of a mashing a whole bunch of things. So I don't know why, but for some reason, being in the specifically Federal Bureau of Investigation, that really attracted me at the time. And, and I mean, I could see you because we're in Zoom and you're still excited about it when you talk about it. I mean, you're face Absolutely. lighting up. Yeah. So then you wind up going to uh, NYIT and you get a BA in marketing, right? Yeah, well, I, I don't find those non-related. I mean, because many people have that journey. You know, you grew up and want to be a farmer. You know, who knows? You become a lawyer. You grew up wanting to be a, you know, the next Beyonce. And, and you grew up and be a, a preacher. So that I, I don't know. You know, it is what it is. Uh, but, but yeah, I don't think I would have ever seriously went down that path. But you asked what I wanted to be as a child. So as a child, indeed, you know, FBI. And, and uh, today, even, I'd want to be in the Secret Service counter assault team. I'm not going to be, but it's still, I could, I could watch a ton of movies, you know, on those things for sure. The only movies I watch, so I'm with you. 
Um, so, so then you get the degree in marketing. Then what happens next? You, you go out and work where? Uh, at the United Nations, I believe. Again, not good at dates so well, but I believe my Fine. big part of my career was at the United Nations right out of college or right out of high school, right a, kind of in between there. Um, got a job as like, I guess today you'd call it a secretary. Uh, they called it admin officer at the time. Uh, but administrative clerical support role uh, when I got that first initial job. It wasn't my first job, but one of the first jobs when I was still in my early 20s, 19, 20, something like that. So then when somebody reads your, your background, you, you proudly say, and I got fired from the UN, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so then what happens? You, you, you're out of there, and now what? Yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't a, a serial journey. I mean, I started some side hustles while at the UN. Okay. Some of those I sold when I left the UN. You know, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a I think the word a serial. I think it wasn't a a, a dotted line like that. Okay. But while there, I was I, I was I, I was an entrepreneur while there. You know, I didn't know it, didn't know what it's called. You know, time moves on. Of course, there was no John Lee Dumas or whoever we look at today for all these things. Pat Flynn, but but I, I had the desire to create. I, I clearly didn't know it, you know, you don't know sometimes what you are when you're in the moment, but still then the, the desire, I think the, um, the thirst of the unknown, that really did excite me and today. Now I understand why I, I, that's why I don't finish things so well, because I do like to start things. I don't, you know, after things are done, it just doesn't excite me so much. What excites me is the unknown, the fear, the uncertainty, uh, the, the risk of failure. That does excite me. That Whatever reason, God puts all of it into something. Some people more secure, right? Some people more like, hey, a lady told me a few days ago, Ramon, I'm a, a, a um, worker bee. She told me that because we were talking about something and she, she, she stopped me. She said, Ramon, stop. I like this. I'm a worker bee. And I had to respect it. She likes once it's built or being part of a team, getting together. But some people just like starting stuff and then leaving. You know, that can be bad and good for both cases. But in the perfect sense, some of us like to start stuff. But once it's built, we can hand it over, right, to a worker bee or a leader or a project manager who has the skill set to, to do better at, at growing something. For me, I just like starting stuff. So, so, you, had, so you, you did some side hustles. So you already mm -hmm. dabbled in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at some point, was there a turning point when you decide to take it now I call it seriously in quotes where, okay, this is what I want to do. Was there a uh, well, that was Yeah, well, that was when I was forced to. It wasn't a decision. That was when I got fired from the UN because while there, I was thinking, oh, I'll get a million dollars in the bank. I'll get $100,000 in the bank. I'll get a dollar in the bank. Whatever the thing was that I was going to have my safety net so I could be safe and secure and have my own business. But I thank God that that never happened. I was fired. And so that pushed me out as it were imagine the baby thrown into the water in a good way whatever age the baby is that you teach about a sim like that that example so i was pushed and thrust into the water um uh yeah and that's when i had to then you know understand i had to provide for my family i had to eat so poverty and 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 the proverbial gun to your head is a good thing sometimes damon john right talks about the power of broke and so that's a healthy thing uh, to put all this, this this few skills and things i learned while at the un had a safe steady income then i was able to turn that into okay i got to build a business somehow you know and they were small little companies i'm though i didn't build some big billion dollar brand but for me and what i've done taking care of my family yeah it, it was good it still is good so I didn't know. So you already had a family by then. So that was yes. the impetus to say, okay, I'm fired. So all right, yes. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Yeah. And if Got I didn't it. have them, to your point, right, as we're talking, if I didn't have them, who knows, Zev, right? Because then if you didn't, you know, you're a family man, you don't have that. You can sleep on your friend's couch, get some oodles and noodles and, and just still play around. But yeah, when you got a family and then you're pushed to the wall, you do have to either make some decisions. You know, you have to, those of us men are, and women who are responsible and want to want to care for the people we love, you, you, it forces you to do things, you know? So it, it's interesting that anybody, anyone that I've interviewed when we talked about their kind of journey, mm. uh, we all do at some point crazy thing where we go off on our own. But when mm. you're married, uh, the one thing, the consistent theme that I picked up is that everybody that was able to be successful had a very, very supportive wife, supporting wife. Mm. Because, and married and kids, I want to add in my case, not just married yeah, kids. Go ahead. So, so now if you have kids on top of it, yeah. if you get fired from a, you know, nine to five job, whatever mm -hmm. we call it, uh, you know, your average wife would say, well, Ramon, we need, we need to, to put food on the table. Why don't you go get exactly. a real job? Get a real job. But then Ramon wants to do his thing. So clearly, and, and I, I met and I know your wife and your kids, there is somebody behind it that says, no, you want to do this, you go do it. 
you've got my support, you got my blessing, go for it, right? It's a big, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. And let me rephrase the answer is yes to that. But I think rephrase it. I think the aspect also talking about support, I think, is that sometimes it goes wrong because the entrepreneurs that are just starting out, that person, whether it's their wife or their husband, you know, the money's not coming. So that makes it very, I think the word is tenuous. My English is not so good sometimes. I think that's the word tenuous. That makes it very scary where sometimes you do need to think you need to get the job. But thankfully, yes, I have a supportive wife and supportive family. Absolutely, indeed, full stop. And since I had some money in the bank account, we had a little cushion. I was talking to the founder of Love Sack. Uh, Love Sack, and yeah. those who don't know, okay, some don't know, you know, makes the like the cush, cushions and couches and these cool things. And he said, um, many startups, and even though I don't consider myself a startup, like the, you know, the high value VC startup, but nevertheless, he said many startups don't work because they don't have the runway. And so one tip, I love to thank you for sharing my story, but I love to also share tips with people is that one tip for those listening and your listeners, Zev, is that runway. So if you have a short runway, that pushes you to do some things. But if you're blessed to have the longer runway you have, now you have some breathing room. So in my case, maybe I had six months of whatever our family's budget is. For some people, if you're Jeff Bezos, you need 10 billion a month. So, you know, for some people, for me, I could live on a lot less per month. So when I was fired, I had a, a, a client, I had some money in the bank account, and that was able to carry me through that I could, I wouldn't call it an experiment because I was dabbling in entrepreneurship while at the UN. So I just was able to put gasoline on the fire, I think. Yeah, gasoline on the fire and, uh, and, and, and move that forward indeed. So yeah, support of life, yes. And I don't remember which famous person said that, and we'll get to talk mm -hmm. about celebrities later. Uh, but someone said that his biggest advice was that anyone that considers entrepreneurship, save, 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 mm. right? And, and that's to, to your point. If you're going to go step off the cliff into the entrepreneurship roller coaster, as we call it, yeah. uh, you know, that runway you refer to is the ability yes. to have a little bit of a cash flow cushion that allows you to go do your thing without Correct. the tremendous pressure of no money coming in, because we all know particularly in, in my world in marketing and, and what I do, uh, it, it takes time. It takes, yeah. it, I, I think the magic number that I've found in, in the years that I've been doing this and working with entrepreneurs also, 18 months seems to be like the, mm, yeah. the, the time frame for whatever reason, where when you start yep. something, that's sort of like the turning point where things begin to fall into place. But Correct. to your point, if you're trying to do this with no money, no resources, no cushion, uh, and you're married and there's kids and there's pressure, financial pressure, that's brutal. That's really, yeah, really yes. hard, right? Um, and and to add to that, I think, you know, is that is that and and the leverage, you know, as you as you're doing it and, and those who have a full time job, keep it. You know, meaning don't don't yeah. rush out necessarily, you know, to just, oh, I want to do this. But while you're there, hone your skills, get your first or second customers and clients. Then you leave. You have, as Zev is saying, less pressure, longer runway. And hey, you, if you're playing dice, which I never have, but if you're playing dice, that's your best chance of success. Long runway, less pressure. Woo, that's a nice yeah. combination right there. And, and again, this is an entrepreneurship podcast and you're, you live this stuff on a daily basis. Um, you know, the mistake that we all make and everybody that we know makes it, they fall in love with their product and their technology and they think people are just going to line up and, and just come in and buy it. And we know that doesn't happen that way. You really got to, you got to hustle. You really, really, the word you used before was hustle. You really, really have to go at it and it takes time. And we also know the statistics, right? Most people quit right before that point that they were just about to make it, uh, which is, which is pretty interesting. So um, I, I don't think I would ever describe you as a celebrity, celebrity, even though you wrote a book, The Celebrity CEO, and I want to talk about it a little bit. Uh, I went looking for, I'm always curious, like, what the heck is a celebrity? But well, I know these people that I know. So so the dictionary word is a famous person, the state of being well-known. That's right. Which sort of leads into where I think I saw a shift in, in your career since I've kind of followed you very closely for eight years. Um, you, you, I'm going to say you used to because you still are a technology minded person you know technology is a big deal and but at some point i think you were shifting a little bit towards the personal branding side of things right that became a recurring theme mm -hmm. um why is that so important sure and i will let me just qualify no notwithstanding the book or anything like that but just to qualify the aspect celebrity i encourage everybody to be a celebrity meaning that pastor 
who's the pastor of a 50-person church, he is the celebrity in that 50-person church. So just to qualify that, yeah, most people get think of Donald Trump, Obama, Kardashian, take your pick, that type of global celebrity. But now nah, celebrity could be, I just went to a local deli here, visited my sister here in Harlem. That guy who owns that local, not deli, but bodega on the corner, he's a celebrity to the few hundred people every day who come in for a pack of cigarettes and a gallon of milk. So in that context, but I think the shift in white personal branding, I, I think Zev is important to me. And I, a lot of a few things, unfortunately, I do very strategically, but I think I realized that that's something that I could add value. I'm not the best strategist. I'm not good with numbers. I'm not a futurist, things like that. And the reason that I left, not left technology, but I st sold smallbiztechnology.com and stopped talking about technology directly, simply Zev, because I was boring. I was bored rather. And a lot of the vendors who were pitching me, oh, our printer, it's no longer four pages a minute. It's now 4.1, you know, oh, this camera lens. So for years I was in that space, like CNET, ZDNet, that's kind of was my pedigree, PC Magazine, Few remember, I know you will, but few remember the thick, thick PC magazines and all those things. What would that be, Zeb? 90s, maybe, that time era. Those, they're not, or whatever, maybe, whatever the, you know, thing is. But th those aren't around so much. They're all online. So that's when I shifted. Oh, let me cover entrepreneurship in general. And then, yes, to your point, I think the one thing that I can hang my hat on, you know, I like to cover a lot of things. I like to learn. I interview people. But the thing that I can say, I've done it and I've done it well, is personal branding. Myself, I've gotten on, I'm talking to Zeb on his podcast and other media have covered me in TV and et cetera. So since I've done that, that's something that I can hang my hat on and say, hey, you can do it too. Is that helpful? Does that explain that? So, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, so for people that listen or entrepreneurs, and again, for me, entrepreneurs, by the way, I don't know why we distinguish entrepreneurs from small business owners. To me, it's some of like the same. Uh, I kind of thought of entrepreneurs as somebody who's a startup and a small business owner, somebody who's a little more established. I don't know if anybody has the answer, but I'll use that as a general term, entrepreneurs. Um, I don't think it matters if you're in business for 15, 20 years or you're just starting up. Why is personal branding so key here, though? Yeah. And for me, this is not something that everybody has to do. But I think it's a choice that you can, I think you could be an asset. So I think personal branding is important because you do have the corporate brand. And whether you call it the images and logos, some people say that, whether you call it it's about culture, that's your whole thing. You know, we can all day long, whatever you want to call the corporate brand. But for me, the personal brand, because for the very tiny small businesses that I speak to, you know, those who are under 100,000 in revenue, those who are trying to get to 500,000 in revenue, that's my, like, it's my people, you know what I mean? Um, your face, what you do, how you sound, how you smile, how you shake a hand, that's an asset. I don't care how much you want to say I'm Mary's design company. No, I don't know how much you want to say we're, you know, Wolfen, Wolfen, Wolfen and Sons. Nobody gives a darn. You're one person in your apartment and your design company. Let's just face it. And so for me, it's the same thing. Yeah, Zev, I have smart hustle media. Okay. But I know that when the brand's buying from me or somebody's hiring me to speak, it's Ramon. I'm not trying to be, I'm not some 10 person gleaming off his building. I'm just a guy brushing my teeth, sitting in my office, in my little home office for that matter. So you get what I'm saying, meaning we can pretend, you know, now there are companies that are a hundred person firm and people don't know the founder or care so much. That's great. Your corporate brand is important. You could walk in a room, nobody would know you founded the company, nobody would know you're, you're the CEO because that logo, your brand, the customer service, that's most important. But for us really small businesses, no. That's Jack, hey, that's Jack the lawyer. Oh, there's Becky, the accountant. It's you, it's you. You still need to have all that design and all the website and branding and culture and, and statement of purpose and all that. But people know it's you. Okay. Can you be a celebrity without a personal brand? Taking the entertainers out of this, I'm talking about the business world. I think it's hard. My, my two cents, I'm used to my definition. I think that your company can be well-known. Yeah. So, so to be clear, you can have a five-person cleaning company, four vans all over Texas, all over a small town in Texas. People see your logo. Like I have one in my town called Purple Cleaning. I don't know the founder, Zev, but I see the van in front of his, his company. So if I saw a purple van cleaning driving around or in front of the McDonald's on the block, I'd be like, oh, there's purple van cleaning again. You feel the difference? So that's the corporate brand. But yeah. I think it's hard. Yeah, if you're not, quote unquote, the celebrity CEO, you're not the well-known in your industry, that goes back to you. You're speaking at conferences. You have podcasts. You're writing blog posts. You're, you're on maybe TV once in a while or whatever you're doing. You're doing events. You have a book out. That's kind of, I think it's got to kind of be you leveraging your personal brand. 
you're automatically going to be, quote unquote, the celebrity CEO of your industry, I think. Yeah, and, and that's and that's it's a really good point because some some brands we know the the CEO is the brand. Like we can't think of Apple without Stephen Jobs, and right. we say Amazon, it's always Jeff Bezos. But for us, our guy, you know, people like like mm -hmm. us, let's say people like me who live on yeah. in the trenches, yeah, who are not that mega me companies. Yeah, I think from my perspective, you're right, the, the corporate brand is important. That's a marketing function, but sure. for very often it's it's important to know who's the visionary behind it That's because right. they have a story to tell. And when you hear their story and you connect with the story and the corporate brand, that's kind of a recipe for success. Now, that's right. not everybody is capable, able to do the personal branding piece, right? Which leads me to my question to you is, when did you discover that you love public speaking? Because if anybody has seen you uh, on the stage, you're, you're like, like one of these things that were wound and you release them and they just oh, pop. Thank you. And they pop. And it, it's, it's very easy to see that, first of all, you know, because I've said it about you in comments and posting and whatever, the thing that I love about you is that you're not some make-believe. There's no the Ramon personal branding guy and then there's a different Ramon. I think it's one of the same. Uh, you're transparent, you're, you're upfront, you're, you're humble. And when you get on a stage, you're very genuine. You're not, it's not, you're not putting on a show. You're just being you because you love that piece, right? But for, for most people, and, and we know that, public speaking is one of the biggest things they fear. It's frightening to them. Um, sure. When did you discover you love this stuff? Yeah, I think that was some time ago. I think uh, that was about, my son is about 26. And I use this because again, I'm not, some people can rattle about using it. Some people can rattle up dates. I was baptized at 1922 <laughs> at four o'clock PM under a tree. No, it was under a maple tree. I'm like, whoa, I can't do that. We got married. I remember hearing the water. I, I'm just not the type of guy. But since I remember, because the, the what do you, I don't know what you call it, like men mentally, but when you have a, a, a memory device, like you can remember, oh, I heard the car crash because I was eating ice cream, whatever you call that, Zeb, yeah, yeah. Track. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the point is my son was four years old playing under a chair when I was speaking at SCORE, you know, the free government consulting yeah. service, 26 Federal Plaza. So he's 26. He was about four years old, Zev. So I can remember, maybe you know Jennifer Shaheen. I don't know if you know that name. You may know. I, yeah. Technology yeah. therapist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she goes way back too. And that's, that's why I think when I have one of my first speaking engagements, she said, Ramon, I can't make it. Can you go speak? And I'm not saying that was my very first one, but that was about the time when I was like in front of an audience. And so I think that's where I love to learn connecting with people. And to your, to your point, Zeb, today, I do realize that I'm not trying it, but I think if we all have a gift, you're a darn good marketer, you're a strategist, you know these things. That's not my gift. I'm not the guy who's strategist, spreadsheet, and diving into the nuts and bolts of a business. Not my gift. But, but I do love the entertainment side. I like it. I like bringing people together. I like audience theatrics. I like it. And so I've been doing this for, um, yeah, for a number of years. It so happens, it's only in the realm of business, right? Meaning mm -hmm. since I started a few businesses, I love business, I love marketing. I can wrap that around being Ramon. I think it's interesting because I think you, it's the first time I heard you say that because to you, public speaking is a form of entertainment and you love that piece. And I know how you operate because you're on a stage, you don't flip PowerPoint slides, you engage the audience, you get the energy from them. And, and that's one of the things that gets you going. Um, but I never thought of public speaking as a form of entertainment because for most people that are really scared shitless about doing it. Yeah. In, and, and for and, me, it has evolved, Jeff, in fairness. It has evolved into that word, but go ahead, please. Yeah, because and, and again, because we, I mean, you, you're you big in the networking world and I've had my share of three to five years of the weekly networking. And absolutely, even though I'm comfortable, you know, every time you stand up and you do your 60 second elevator pitch, your heart's beating. Even though these people yes. around the table know you and you do this every week. Uh, and then if you do a bigger venue where there's more people, uh, I always looked at it as sort of a challenge, you know, because it's frightening, right? It's, it's just take this on. Like somebody encouraged me five, six years ago when I was doing CrossFit because I'm making everybody laugh. They said, you know, you're kind of funny guy. Once a year, there's a, there's a contest called the funniest Jewish comedian in New York City. And I said, okay, okay I never heard of it. I'm not in that circle. <laughs> and they said, you should do this. And I said, no, no, I'm a one liner funny guy, but I'm not one of these. I want to prepare a, a right, gig. Right. And they said, no, no, you should do it. 
And because it really scared me, mm. I decided to go, I'm going to do it because I, it was you. really petrifying. And I signed up. And long story short, you know, th there is a contest. I forgot the comedy club. There were six people that were supposed to be supposed to bring 10, 15 people, you know, to the venue. There were nice. six people. Three of them would make it to the final. And one of, out of the final would get a gig for a year in, in a comedy club, right? So I show up with my 10 plus Your people. posse. Yeah. <laughs> my wife refused to come because she doesn't think I'm funny. I've never been funny. Oh. But, but the rest of them showed up. We uh -huh. come in. So out of the six people that were, des that they were scheduled, yes, uh, yes. Two, two didn't show up. So we're down to four. One guy got, uh, got there early and got so drunk they threw him out. And so we were left with three. And I worked on this for three months. I wrote stuff and I ripped it up and I practiced in front of the mirror and I stumbled and I didn't remember what I'm supposed to say. It was really, really frightening. And then you get up in a, in a club with their, I don't know, there were 60, 70 people and you get, and the guy says, oh, by the way, because it's only three of you, instead of two and a half minutes, you can get five. And I said, five. <laughs> yeah, that's five not is good in that eternity. case. Right? It is, and so I I did it. It was absolutely frightening. I'm, I'm not going to bore you. The only thing, my opening line, I was probably the only funny thing I said was, "Does anybody, the owners, have you anyone in the audience heard about a recall of adult depend diapers?" Hmm. And he said, and they all look at me and I said, "Because uh, because this is I'm scared shitless. I'm wearing a diaper right now. I hope there's no recall in this that's going to fail on me." But that was it. So anyway, that is good. Your, that is your good. Four, again. Because I know so many people that are scared yes. of public speaking. You yes. said, okay, to me, it's entertainment. And that, that that's the clue. So somebody's scared of it and think of it as entertainment, entertaining or entertainment. That's that's perfect. Um, uh, so for some reason, Zen, I can't. I can hear you. About that. I, I can't. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can't hear you, Zen. Oh, no. Yeah, play with your tech. I'm here. I can hear you fine. <sighs> Talk to me, Zev. Hello. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Sorry Got about it? that. We're back, okay. everybody. We're ah, back. No I problem. Know. That's why I have a great guy who masters yeah. my podcast. He okay, can take good. all this stuff out. So, can I, can so, I tell you two um, comedian stories, uh, Zev? Yes, go. Go. Is it time? Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so two stories for me. One, talking about Jewish. I would, I'll, my, my version of this, I was invited to do the similar thing at the National Society of Black Engineers. And there was comedy, there was swimwear, and there was uh, formal wear. So I did win the formal wear and swimwear. But the only time people laughed as ever when I did the comedy routine is when I left the stage. Think about that for a while. That's the only time the audience roared with applause. And similar to you, two minutes, you know, you get your bit because it wasn't funny, it was dead. And then the other one, I was doing something on stage with, with somebody named Junior, part of Steve Harvey's entourage or show, you know, his protege, whatever you wish to call, you know, on the Steve Harvey has a radio show. And uh, Zeb, Zeb, I had a choice. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. So I was at an event. And he started making fun of me because I was hosting it, but he, we were kind of co-hosting it. So, you know, we were killing time. And he's like, look at his shoes. He was just ripping me apart. So in the moment, Zev, I could either fire back or shut up and just smile and, okay, and, you know, yeah. waiting for time to go on in my earpiece. So I decided to not fire back. I said, this guy's a professional comedian. The moment I open my mouth, he will light me up. So do you think I made the right choice? I just, uh, I was going to say, I was going to say one little thing back and make fun of him. I said, nope. Let me not even say anything because then the night's going to be over. He will roast me. <laughs> so, so you 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 sent an email that asked everybody for their opinion about uh, what Will Smith did. Oh, hours, sure, right? Which is a similar, not quite the same because a little different, he, but I get it. He was insulting his wife, but mm -hmm. uh, um, similar thing, right? Will Smith had a choice. He could have taken it later, deal with it, but he decided to go on stage in front of 50 million people and slap Chris Rock in the face, right? Um, I, think, I think you made the right choice because first of all, look, we all like to tassel and we like to challenge, but when you are aware of your own deficiencies, yes. why would you want to set yourself up to be embarrassed by going off a guy who's a yes. pro, right? It just It's like those guys in the comedian rooms, we've all seen them. They're the idiot in the front row. They try to poke fun at the comedian night's over oh, that, it, it. It, it's over yeah I it, think, you know what i'm not gonna be that guy <laughs> absolutely and, and i was a, and i love comedy so i used to take my yeah. my kids we used to go a lot and we 
And we would sit in the front or right under the mic. And of course, the guy picks on my daughter. Because he, he doesn't see that she's with me. And he starts yeah. getting very sexual. And oh. then he stops and he says, uh, by the way, do you know that guy? And she says, it's my dad. And he goes, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So, and look, look, it's all, look, comedians cross yeah. the line. You have to expect it. I, I don't know. I don't think Chris Rock was aware of, of Jada's uh, disease, whatever the, yeah. it's called. Uh, Apalaka, something like that. To pay chapel. I don't remember the name, but to, yeah. to your point, yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank absolutely, you. 100%. <laughs> I, listen, I, I wouldn't tussle with a guy who's bigger than me. Yeah. I mean, I was, I'd say, look, if, you, if we get into a fight, I can run faster yeah. than you, but I'm not getting close and getting yeah. my, getting kicked. Yeah. Especially um, professional comedian, you know, years of experience. Anyway, thanks for that. Was fun, so, Jeff. That, a little so, bit about so, so, Ramon, in 2013, you wrote a book on Facebook marketing nine years ago. And I think Facebook asked you to write it, right? It was mm -hmm. they commissioned it. Mm -hmm. um, nine years, like in, in digital years, like dog years, it's, it seems like ancient history, right? Book um, is out of date, like an hour after it was printed, it was out of date. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, so now we fast forward to today. What has changed since you wrote the book? What, what were some wow. of the, the big changes do you think do you see now? So many changes. Cookies, of course, are on the decline. Cookies, for those who don't know, the little trackers in your website that marketers have used for years to track us and knit together, you know, who Zeb is, who Ramon is. Okay, he bought a shoe and click this link over here. He's home and he's looking at, let's feed him an ad for a shoe. So that's one thing, cookies, you know. Then iOS, with the iOS update, right? They call it for safety and security, whatever the real reason is. You know, people, Apple uh, really has, I, I thought it was a joke, Zeb, and of course, you know, it's not because you're a marketer, but all the small businesses I talked to, no Ramon, that iOS update, asking people to get permission to track them has yep. downed and has raised the cost of advertising. That's two. I think number three, what I'm hearing from several people, I heard this from Ryan Dice of Digital Marketer, you know, the traffic yeah. oh, I know, summit. Ryan. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I heard this at Social Media Marketing World as well, echoing this from Mike Stelzner. The, the, again, this is just more an ivory tower academia, but I think it's a real thing. The resurgence of communities, of individuals. Um, uh, what's the, the Spanx founder lady? I forgot her name, but the um, Sarah the Blakely. Yes, yeah, Sarah Blakely's husband, uh, Jesse. It's Jesse, like, Jesse. Has, I actually Jesse. met him at an event. Okay, good. The coolest guy I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. He's awesome. he has a, an app called Build Your Life Resume. Just a community of a few thousand of us. What I'm trying to get to is the third change I see, even though Facebook has groups, the rise of intimacy of groups. So that's three. Um, I think four, you know what? Yes, the, the aspect of user generated content, fireside, clubhouse, uh, the, the competitive landscape. Facebook, for all we know, maybe it won't be dominant in five years or 10 years. So I hope that made some sense. But those are some things I think are changing. And one thing's not changing, Zev. And again, I'd love to hear from you because you have your eye on this. You help clients with this all the time. But is people, a smile, a shake, humans at the end of the day, it's still humans. No matter how much metaverse and AI and Bitcoin are there, mm. in-person events, clubhouse, right? Isn't it all about one human? on their headset, laughing and talking to another human. That I don't think is ever going to go away. So I, I think that for me, and, and I really, really dislike Facebook, I have to be honest, but uh, I was waiting for the point where the whole Facebook thing will start backfiring. Um, mm. Because, uh, you know, the people that are addicted to it, fine, we'll, we'll take them out of the equation. But uh, it wears you out. The, the stuff that's on there, the irrelevant nonsense just wears you out. And I think what I was anticipating is that people will start craving what you just said, the personal intimacy, the connections, because it's, it's such a digital universe where, I mean, the kids that we see growing up, I was talking to somebody the other day and she said, and she said I, have to, I have to punish my kids. And I said, well, that's easy. You take your cell phone and you disconnect the Wi-Fi at home. Done. Done. Right. Done. You can't you can't hurt them more than that. That's absolutely they don't know what to do. And and my kids, I don't know what year it was when we had the the blackout in New York. Remember mm -hmm. that one? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, it was six, seven, eight years ago. It was over the summer and I mean, everything went dark and the kids right. were in the house and it was a beautiful day. And I and they said, What do we do? What do we do? When where do you think it's gonna come back? I said, I don't know, but you know what? <laughs> It's beautiful outside. Let's go for a walk in the neighborhood. That's right. And then my daughter said, what? Why? Right? Because it's beautiful. I think, I think, uh, look, I hope that people are 
rebelling against this flat dimension of digital crap and mm-hmm. going back to I want the connection. So you're right. Those those communities, those the, associating yourself with a tribe that of people that you have something in common with, or you don't. Doesn't matter. Meeting new people. Um, that's that's like so that's interesting so you wrote that book nine years ago and you're right like like maybe two weeks later boom it's it's done, out of done. Uh, so um so i want to ask you because and and i am seriously i'm trying i'm holding my back on i don't want this podcast to be the 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 host was showering the guest with compliments and, and name dropping. So that's not my style. I kind of try to follow Guy Raz and what he does. Uh, and by the way, I discovered an amazing podcast, Guy Kawasaki, Remarkable People. Hmm. I live for those things. If you haven't listened to him, that guy is, inc- he just had John Lee Dumas. I, nice. I heard him in the car today. Um, so you are literally everywhere, everywhere. I mean, you, you, so I wanted to know what your typical day is like, because for people that don't understand for, to create content, yeah, you can hire virtual assistants and content writers and they can do the stuff for you. They can do some things for you, which is fine. But the things that you do, no one can do except Ramon, because it's you, it's your personal brand. It's your interaction. It's the reason why when we see a Ramon posting, we actually stop and listen and read the stuff. What's your typical daylight? Because that's a lot of work. I mean, it's probably intuitive to you now, right? But sure. how do you get this stuff done? I think I'm going to disappoint people um, because, and and, and as you hinted, Zev, yes, it's having a great team. And as you hinted, if you see my face, it's only my face. However, one tip or advice, if it's helpful for all, for those, and, and I know you know this already, Zev, but I try to multiply everything I do. So if I have a speech or a talk or I'm on Clubhouse or wherever it may be and I'm doing it, I don't want that asset just to be there, whether it's me or a team member and anybody can do this, I want them to rip that sucker apart. (laughs) So take what I just said, put it on my IG, take what I just said, make a blog post from it. And that's the tip for everybody here. So those listening and you're a leadership coach and you just had a good talk at NYU or you were at South by and had a talk at South by, you can have your team, your guy, your gal, hire somebody off of Upwork, Fiverr, or whatever you want, have them record it. You did that there, but then cut that up. Maybe that one hour talk you did become a 30 second motivational meme that you could put on TikTok. So that's kind of where this and the C and the being everywhere to some degree, I guess I am everywhere, but I think it's also because we're everywhere where we hang out. Our circles and our passions, at least, you know, the public ones are very narrow. You're a small business marketer, my words, you know, as I would position you. I'm in the small business space too. So we're going to begin to see each other like like Guy Kawasaki. I know the podcast, John Lee Dumas, you mentioned. I have John Lee Dumas' book, right? So these are similarities, but I bet people a few degrees away from us. They don't even care about John Lee Dumas, which is okay. Meaning, so I think that's what we're seeing. And that's the beauty of small niche networks because the, you know, the veterinarian who only cuts the hair of gerbils, dumb examples of, but you know, he's (laughs) all those who love gerbils are going to see this guy everywhere. I don't know who they are, but if you love gerbils and you (laughs) love to cut gerbil hair, which is a dumb example, you're going to see the doctor of gerbil haircutting everywhere because you're reading gerbil hair magazine gerbil hair podcast go ahead please but i want i want to push back on you because you're being always being so humble the the point i was making is i don't ever remember sending you an email and not getting a response Uh, that's literally literally within reasonable amount of time which we could say under a minute or maybe two minutes. now (laughs) if you take the, the the number of people that reach out to you and and your activity level um and you multiply my email by god knows how many 10x 100x sure it's still you know it's it's still i, I mean i would say i'm I'm amazed that he answered me so well, thank quickly. you that's a busy thank guy you. right i have good systems I, thank you for recognizing that but i do have good systems you know filtering and and uh yeah and that's and every and everybody has a gift right so meaning for me 
I just, uh, I, I make, a, as you know, Zeph, I make a lot of mistakes or my team does. Uh, I do between, depends on who's doing it and who's doing what. But the point is that's one thing I do well is taking a lot of information and fast dissect it. Fast mm -hmm. to hear, okay, all this I can ignore, this, boom, let's do this. So I have a zero, especially for email, I have a zero email inbox policy. Um, and I think that helps me. So I'm very, even though I do get hundreds of emails a day, you know, I mess with them. A lot of them I can filter on certain words. Some of them come to my inbox, some come to another box. And those that I need to look at, boom, yeah. I try to get, I try to take care of it really fast. Yeah, because because I know people who are business owners who are absolutely obsessed with the need to answer emails instantly because they think mm -hmm. that the expectation today is that what do you mean you didn't answer me in five minutes <laughs> well because and actually i i have a client and this is no joke uh the the man buried his wife because she died unfortunately from cancer mm -hmm. he was answering leads at the gravesite because and again it's it's more than obsession it's part of the the mindset of the corporate yeah. mantra where yeah. And, and the promise is, if you go to their website and the marketing we do for them is, we always call you back. You are never mm -hmm. going to have to sit there and wait. To birth. And, and taking it to the extreme, you're on a grave site and you answer yeah. leads because it's that important to you. Mm -hmm. You and I might say, okay, you know what? It, it would have been okay to someone else to monitor your email at the time and maybe answer for you. Um, but that creates an incredible amount of pressure that I think I think affects people's ability to yeah. run an effective business because yeah. it's not you don't have to answer something instantly. It's important that you answer, yes. uh, and and not maybe not. That's why look, you, you're a tech guy. You, you I think you're still a tech guy. Yeah. Uh, the whole proliferation of bots, the yes. automatic messengers. When you go to a website and you ask and it said chat if you have a question and you click and then it's the bot that comes on. Yes. And from keywords, give you an answer. And sometimes I don't want, I don't want to talk to a person. There is no press zero yeah. on chat. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And it's, in, it's incredibly frustrating. And although it's efficiency and I get that piece, I think people like you and me, we crave the, the human interaction. And, sure. and I think the companies that do it well are the ones that, yes, the chat's there, but if you want to, there's a button that says, Oh, I'd rather speak to a person. Boom, the human comes in. Uh, sure. that, no, that's sure. the important piece. Um, and Jeff, can I give you a um, can I give you a poor man's bot that I use? Please. Not gonna bot. Yeah, I found, and this is something you can help me say this better. But there's a service I use called ManyChat. They're not a client or anything like that, but I pay for the Many ManyChat M A N Y, and they have, as you may know, you know, they have bots that you can connect to Instagram, Facebook, and other platforms. Hmm. So what I found happening, I say things like, "Hey, DM me a certain keyword on Instagram." And I'll get an instant reply. It's by bot. Some people think it's me. But the key, what I'm saying, let's say that you're a um, watch repairer. Silly example. I don't want to use myself, a yeah, watch yeah. repairer. And you're giving a big seminar, a big event. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for listening to me. We're at the end of the watch repair talk. If you DM me on Instagram the word watch repair, I'll send you my top 10 guides to repair your best watch. Using this tool, you then can automatically are replying to people on Instagram giving them a link, giving your tips, driving them further into your funnel. So just talking about automation. But the key thing I found, Azeb, is that when you have those talks, those webinars, they often live forever. I get DMs from people and I know I'm not on stage, which means the bot's working. People are DMing me the word, the keywords I've been saying in my speeches. And I'm like, yeah. huh, I got three or four or five or 10 DMs today, clearly people saw my speech somewhere. So I just wanted to leave that with no, people. That's yeah. a way to, to use bots. Very cool. It was called what? Many? Uh, many chat, M-A-N-Y, many chat. And then many. they have a whole system that can connect to Instagram, to Facebook and things like this, uh, which is, you know, for, especially for content marketers, it could be for anything, but I found it really cool. Yeah. I mean, bots and technology for the sake of expediency and giving people something they ask for is 100% time. But there are times where they need more Absolutely. And you can't let the bot take over. Like even right. in the old days when you and I, I mean, you got me into it, talked about Infusionsoft, which is now sure, key. Sure. If you look at the if you look at the workflow, there's always a, a, a milestone in the automation that says, okay, now salesperson gets involved. That's which, right. Which That's is right. really important. Um, so, you know, remote, there was, you, there's one thing you always talk about. And, and again, because you're open and I'm not bringing anything that people haven't seen before. You're incredibly, uh, a very spiritual guy. Hmm. 
uh, the, the spiritual part is very, very important to you. You always talk about church. You always talk about, you know, God. Um, it's a big part of who you are in your life. It, it, is that an ingredient, an important piece of your success, do you think? I'd like to think. If I said no, I'd be disingenuous to who I am. But I think so. And I think that, listen, we can live on this world just materialistic for ourselves. And there's a part of that. I like ice cream. I want cake. I like burnt pancakes. That's the fleshly materialistic. We talked about comedy, right? That's the stuff in this earth. But I do think, Zev, that it keeps you grounded. We're all imperfect. I'm the most imperfect person. We all have too much anger, whatever things we do in life. But I do think, Zev, whatever your faith may be, having a faith, having grounded and knowing that there's someone in my case, but again, people can take this as far as they want. That's a higher power. I think it keeps you grounded. It keeps you, it keeps you focused. It keeps you settled. And so, yes, that's very important in my faith. I happen to be a Christian. So I think, yes, I think for, not I think, but for me, uh, it's kept me grounded. And as you said, Zeb, it is a part of me. It's not something that I wear and nothing is bad to do it, but on my shoulder, my sleeve, like this kind of thing, it's just who I am. It's been part of me. And so I'd like to think that in some way that keeps me grounded, that we can still be good people, but I think it's like a little adding a little extra salt or hot sauce, or, or maybe that's the main ingredient. I should reverse that. That's the main ingredient and in that, but thank you for asking. But yes, it's very important. Yeah, because it, it's interesting. It's I mean, you, you could still be a celebrity CEO and be an atheist because Absolutely. Correct. Uh, we're not saying that you have to believe in, in God or somebody right. in order to be successful. But I think in your case, for me, again, it, it's interesting how you bring it down to earth literally yes. when you say it keeps me grounded because yeah look if you believe in a higher power and you believe that you're here for a reason and and i think if you're spiritual because i know you you like that you believe that you're here to right. serve and yeah. and make life better uh that's who you are so there's it's yeah. it's right there and, um, and if i can add one thing Zef, i must say that m many people you know um who are into mindset and personal development most all of them say, when well, I wake up early in the morning and I do my meditation, my yoga, my whatever it is, there's that. For me, I'm not a yoga person, meditation person in that, but it's ironic. As you know, I do wake up every morning. And I, for me, again, whatever book that's important to Zev or whoever listening, when I read my Bible, I pray. So there is interesting that parallel time of let me start the day right. That's kind of what's, what's <laughs> equal amongst people that you're seeing this common thread. So somebody, maybe I work out. Some people, maybe I write in my journaling. For me, my version of that is my prayer and, and Bible reading and then thinking of the day. Then I go do smart hustle and start the day after that. <laughs> so, you're going to like this, although I'm not super spiritual. I'm definitely sure. not. Def, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not a rabbi like Joe Apfelbaum, sure. who was on last week. But, <laughs> but I, I remember in, in, you know, in some circles where I was hanging out with Chabad sure. guys and got to know them, um, they, they have a way of, of describing spirituality in a different way. When you talk about mm. the Bible, and, and they would say, you know, in Judaism, there, uh, Judaism actually separates mm -hmm. um, uh, divine interve intervention from personal responsibility, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty interesting. And so what, what they would tell you and the piece that I like is, look, so, so God or Moses gave you the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, or the Bible, if you want to go that way. That's your user manual, Okay for life i like that <laughs> you read the manual and you follow some of the stuff that's there you'll operate the vcr and it's not going to break down right that's the user manual i i'm sorry people but probably don't even know what a vcr is most of our listeners right. but uh whatever you'll Video figure cassette out that recorder google it. <laughs> yeah the, the eight track cassette review. you'll figure out how to use the the iphone if you read the yes. user manual uh, but that's sort of like the approach, and, and it's pretty interesting. So uh, I want to touch on one other subject. You brought it up, uh, and I bring it up not just because you brought it up, because I think it's incredibly important. I know nobody's asked you about it, because, it, and, and that gives me pleasure. So X years ago, you were very open on one of your Facebook posts or a video when you talked about depression, mm -hmm. struggle with depression. and you know, Michael Phelps, we know he's got the issue now. He's, he's promoting this, you know, whatever, this app that mm -hmm. you can talk to somebody. Uh, Robin Williams. I mean, it's very interesting that, that the most successful people wind up at some point saying, yeah, but by the way, I, I have, I'm, I've been struggling with depression. Mm -hmm. And I think, at least for me, uh, as an ex-psychology major, still obsessed with the human brain, 
I think there, there are two types of depression. There's the clinical depression where you can't help it. There is a great issue of body metabolism, hormones, something that's going on in your body that is off and then needs to be addressed with medication, et cetera. So that's one type of depression. I think when that piece is not being addressed, people wind up committing suicide and going off the deep end. Um, but the other piece is, is the piece that, and the reason I bring it, Ramon, is because Please. we live in a, in a small business world, right? And I think depression is part of entrepreneurship. And, and I know for me, and I think everybody else, in, including you, and that's why I kind of want your take on it, I walked away from a, from a high paying executive position, cold turkey, boom, jumped into entrepreneurship 10 years ago. Um, and like you said, I was able to, to tap into my savings to give me the runway to make it work. But it went from a, you go from a six figure income to zero. Mm. That's brutal. Yes. Um, and the 18 months that it took me to build myself was sleepless nights, stomach ache panic attacks, depression. And, and, and the many times that you say, well, you know, I can always go get a job. And then the other piece of me said, no, you're, that's chicken crap. You know, you can do this. Keep going, keep going. Um, and so I, I want to bring it up because I know you, you shared about this. How do you, how do people, how do you, what's your advice? How do you, what's your advice for people to deal with it? Cause it's part of, it's definitely part of life, but in our case, because we're, your tribe is of small business entrepreneurs. How do we deal with it? Sure. No, thank you for asking the question. I will summarize the context. Yes, I suffered for some time, again, whether clinical or not, you know, I, I, as you already clarified, but I just want to be careful that some people said to be careful. So I call it depression. And I did suffer with thoughts of suicide. A uh, period of time, Zev, really wanting to kill myself, uh, deep depression, feeling bad anxious, annoyance, whatever you want to call it. You've already said it very well. Thank you. And so, um, and that actually I was in a car uh, some years ago and just said, you know, I'm just tired of it. Uh, but the point is that I think um, I, I call it, I think I'm not sure I coined it, but you know, entrepreneurial depression. And I think that part sets in your right because A, there's a God complex, right? Not me and Zev, but those outside of us, ooh, Zev's an entrepreneur. Ramon's a small business owner. I have to work at a big company. They get, you know, there's that, oh yes. We're like the people on Shark Tank. Look at us. You know, so that whole complex. Uh, then there's your family, right? For guys, we want to be, again, I'm not being uh, sexist here, but this is generally a lot of guys, we want to be the providers and protectors. Well, we don't have that, Zev. It's jacked up. Oh, I'm a failure. Ladies, they want, they often feel bad because they're not with their kids. We just operate different that way, men and women. So that's the lens. And how to combat that then, Zev, especially for us business owners, I think a few things. How to combat depression. I think one, um, get a mentor, get a friend, somebody you can talk to. I think two, explain to your family what's going on. I've done that to my wife and my kids, especially when they're smaller. They knew dad's traveling and he gets a check from that or something will come from that. Or, oh, he's sending invoices. That means in 30, 60, 90, 120 days, shh, he'll get paid on that. So educate your family what's happening. Point number three, don't Take off more than you can chew. I think four, surround yourself with friends are those who will uplift you because as you said, Zef, it's a brutal life out there. And you have enough people in you. You're doing what again, Zef? You, you didn't take off today, Zef? And they don't understand. They have no clue what they're asking. They keep thinking corporate mindset. But if you surround yourself with people who get you, that carries you through. So there's a few things I would say, Zef. Surround yourself with people. Uh, explain to your family. Um, also, have some grit. And it's not something you can manufacture, you can't go to a class, but some people, Zev, I wonder, maybe they shouldn't have been in business. Maybe they started off at the wrong time. Maybe this fight was not for them. They would make a great nurse. They'd make a great taxi cab driver. They'd make a great chef. But this is a ball game maybe you shouldn't be playing. So, but let me end on a high note, surround yourself with good people. <laughs> yeah, there's, again, uh, in, in, a, in a spirit of spiritualism, there's a saying in, in Judaism that says, tell me who your friends are. And I'll tell you who you are. Uh, that doesn't apply to Facebook friends because those are fake friends. But I'm talking about what, the, what yes. you're talking about is your circle of people that that will always support you, will tell you what not what you want to hear about, but tell you what you need to do and be honest with you. And I think, again, in your case, I'm sure spirituality helps a lot when it for comes sure. to that, for sure. So I want to end by bringing us back to marketing and can't, can't have a podcast without mentioning your friend and my lifelong mentor, Seth Godin. So, and, and again, I, I pick up on depression because 
one of the things that is incredibly frustrating for all of us, maybe including you, is, is the whole social media posting thing and looking at engagements. So now you work really hard. You come up with, with a really good post. It's meaningful. It's, it's from the heart. And you put it there. And you come back, look at it. And it, eh, one guy, two guys, nobody likes it. I looked at your stuff before because I, I was preparing for this. I went to Facebook. I wanted to find the, the piece about depression. But, you know, I was scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And I was still, I was only like in February 2022. And I said, I should have left a week for this, for scrolling all the way back to whatever. It was. I post a lot. <laughs> but, but yeah, but, but my point is, I look at your stuff, even on LinkedIn, Yes. Sometimes you get two people. Sometimes you mm -hmm. get three people. The Will Smith thing, he got 223 engagements. Forget about it. Uh, your picture with some lady at South by Southwest, some Facebook mm -hmm. lady got 149. Mm -hmm. There's really, I, I try to figure this out. There's no rhyme or reason, right? I mean, I the so. Will Smith thing, yeah, it, it was it was hot, right? So for us who, who work so hard and you post something and you look for, I'm not going to call it recognition, but you look for something, right? right. So I'm going to quote the man I love to death, your friend, your Akimbo sure. partner, who <laughs> said, who, who actually helped me out because I was obsessed with that too. And I said, maybe I should just stop, right? But Seth says in his own language, ship it out. He says, mm -hmm. listen, you got something to say, just say it, ship just it, it, right? And That's who right. cares if people like it? If you have something to say that you feel somebody one day will read and it's important but it's important for you to share that just damn post the damn thing and move on right. right but that that is also a source of like depression and anxiety like ah, people are not liking me why yes. but the answer is the feed moves it's so fast it's right. not a personal condemnation right Ramon? i mean you do this all the time you're right. yeah you're right. i mean do you ever look at this stuff or you just go for it no I, well it's it's cute to say here i just go for it but yeah, as if secretly, like, yeah, I refresh it and look at it. Oh my God, one person or all 50. So, of course. And again, if you've watched what is it, the social dilemma, that's what's trained. I mean, this is not new. You're, you have the psychology, right? As your hobbies, you said whatever. So, we're, we're, you know this better than me. We're trained. The red dot, we want to see it refresh, refresh. We love it. When I was taking swimming lessons, different examples, Ev, but I think it's a similar principle swimming lessons. My teacher would go, Yay, if I swam right, she was teaching me. If I didn't, she'd be silent. I was like a darn dolphin. Is it the same thing they do to dolphins or dogs? Like, good boy, here's the treat. And then nothing if not. So my point, Zev, is yes. And here's what to do. I think there's two or three things that I would say. Yes, just do it. Sure, just ship it. But in fairness, as business owners, we do have to have some ROI in what we're doing, right? So take some lessons. Take some education. Is the post engaging? Are you doing it well? That's number two. And then three, don't have that be your only source. Going back to what you said, marketing, which you do yeah. so well, Zev, email website, social media, audio, clubhouse, podcast, Zoom. There's so faxing, mail, mailing, billboard. I don't care. There's so many things you can do to get the attention of your customers and then educate them, education to a sale. So yeah, don't feel too bad if you don't get engagement on that first post, especially for those who are starting out. But after you've done it for three or six months, if nothing's working, call Zev. <laughs> so so the, I think one of the things that I heard, uh, I don't know who said it, it's not my thing, but someone says, likes don't pay the bills, right? So you gotta remember that. So the like is an instinctual finger thing. I don't know why they do it to begin with. I think people do it because they feel that if they don't press the like next time they post, you're not gonna like them, right? It's one of these craziness, but likes don't pay the bill. And secondly, it's really more about quality than quantity. Right. True. There's a term that I came up with. Okay. I want credit for it, Ramon. Please, I call it yeah, okay. Scar, I call it Scarface marketing. If you remember Scarface the marketing, movie, all right. remember the movie Scarface, where Al Pacino at the end steps on the balcony of his mansion, and all the law enforcement guys are swarming the place, and he takes the machine gun, and he goes say like da 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 say hello to my little friend. Right. To me. Too many people practice Scarface smile, meaning what? Well, mm -hmm. if you if you put bullets in your machine gun and you spray the universe with garbage marketing, you're going to hit somebody. That's but right. the point is, at some point, you're running out of bullets, i.e. money. And so the, the time we just post stuff, remember the old days, hey, put, a, put a blog on, you're going to rank number one on SEO, right? Yeah, whatever, not, not going to happen. 
if you're going to post, do some research, get to know your audience, see what, what matters to them and post something. And again, you might not get 223 engagement on a Will Smith post that you posted, but that's not the point. Some people see it and they just don't, don't remark it. Like you said, it's a, cumul it's a cumulative effect of everything you do from your personal branding to your corporate branding, to all the pieces in marketing that we all work so hard to keep them in balance in total, that's what's going to get your, your business moving forward. So uh, your latest book is The Celebrity CEO. I think we you made a, an eloquent point of, uh, yes, yeah, celebrity doesn't mean you need to be the Brad Pitt of your industry. It means that within your universe, the, the, the people that you serve, you want to be their celebrity. It doesn't mean right. famous. It means the person that they connect with, the person that they may reach out to or go look for answers to their problem that's right. um, and so that's your latest book uh ramon as always when i'm not going to do this five years so now i'm going to try and grab you again shorter i'm having a lot of fun with podcasting so it's it's fine thank you so Good much you. if you want to if you if you don't know ramon you go to what, what ramonray.com ramonray.com ramon Ray. or smarthustle.com either one Ram smarthustle.com is is the the media part of the, the Ramon, RamonRay.com is his personal website where you can book him to speak. Uh, and if you follow him on Facebook and LinkedIn, good luck trying to keep up with his stuff. It's, it's exhausting. That's <laughs> why I go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Zev, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And everybody, thank you, uh, Zev, for having me. And I look forward to people who are following you, Zev, and uh, for the work you do to help businesses grow with their marketing. So thank you, Zev. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, 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 oh,